Senator Carl Levin, welcome to One Detroit, an American Black Journal. Well, Stephen, it's always great seeing you, and it's uh, good to be with you, even though this is a weird way of doing it. <laughs> right, right. We should be in a room together, but still not possible. <laughs> yeah. I'm still optimist, so yeah, that counts. Yeah, soon. Um, so uh, I, I want to start with, uh, of course, uh, talking about this this wonderful memoir. Uh, you've written, uh, but I want to start sort of specifically um, with the idea of, of your career and the, the long career you had, in, in, especially in the U.S. Senate. Um, and, you know, for so, much, so many of us in, in, in Michigan, you know, you are synonymous with the word senator. Uh, you're the first person I ever remember associating uh, with that word, um, and that says a lot, I think, about about how long you did the job and and how much of an impression you made uh, uh, in that job. So I want to go back though to your decision to to do that job. I mean, you were the president of the Detroit City Council, uh, and then you decided you wanted to be a U.S. senator. What was it about the Senate that um, that attracted you to to, to run that? Year? Uh, well, a number of things, actually. Uh, first of all, I had to uh, get the uh, permission, uh, support of family. That's always important. Mm -hmm. uh, but secondly, it was my experience in Detroit, actually, which uh, led to a decision <clears throat> that I should uh, try to bring a point of view that I had to Washington. And that point of view was that... Uh, that government has got to, elected officials have got to be responsive to the public, to their people. They don't always agree with the majority of their people. Uh, you know, a, a good elected official <clears throat> sometimes is gonna do some things which is unpopular as a matter of fact, but in his or her judgment is for the common good and it's necessary then it's his obligation or her obligation, I believe, to do what he or she believes in, in conscience is best for his city or for his state or his country. And so what I found when I was in local government in Detroit is that too often the federal bureaucracy would just, uh, we'd be told by elected officials, uh, well, we can't do much for you. You got 10,000 vacant HUD houses sitting there vacant in your neighborhood, maintained by uh, HUD with as eyesores. They're not being boarded up. They're not being uh, taken care of. There they sit, helping to destroy my town's neighborhood. And when I went to uh, my elected officials, too often I was told, well, the problem isn't with us, it's with the bureaucracy. They're handling this. This is a federal agency decision. And so I actually went to, to Washington believing that Congress should have the obligation of overriding regulations by federal agencies. It was, it was actually part of my platform. It was called legislative veto. Mm -hmm. kind of uh, obscure thought in a way, but I believe in it because of our very disastrous experience with HUD in Detroit. And so that kind of was w one of the driving forces. And it was also, of course, uh, a lot of other things I wanted to try to do for my state. A lot of beliefs that I have in, in people being, uh, being heard, listened to, respected um, and uh, considered um, fully uh, when it comes to a decision making. And, and so you get to Washington uh, and as I say, you, you have an incredible and very long uh, career there that takes you, uh, it seems like to, to lots of different ideas and, and, and places, um, but talk about those those early years uh, 
in Washington? What, what, what frames your work and kind of what frames your thinking about uh, the role once you have it? Well, I, I focused on two things right away. Uh, one was the oversight responsibility, which I've just tried to describe. And I believe Congress has the responsibility and it's one of its major responsibilities to oversee the operations of the federal bureaucracy and to correct uh, things that are happening in society which shouldn't happen. In other words, we, we decided to be part of an investigative effort of government to investigate both the bureaucracy's shortfalls and also the shortfalls in the private sector. And so I was appointed head of a, a subcommittee right away that was doing investigation and oversight. And later on would spend about 10 years as chairman of the, the major permanent subcommittee on investigations. The other thing I wanted to do was to focus on an area that I knew very little about, and that's the military. That's the security of our country and how the military operated and uh, to learn more about something I had not experienced personally because I had never served. And I wanted to, to fill in that major gap and to, to really understand the importance of the military, where it may be wasteful, for instance, and that also occurred in the military, but also to, I also gained a huge respect for our military leadership and the people who serve us. Uh, frankly, I gained a lot more respect for some of our military leaders who are under the control of civilians than I did for some of their civilian leaders, to be blunt about it. Uh, you know, some of the presidents I did not think were great leaders at all, uh, including the second George Bush. Mm. He's a nice guy, but not a great leader mm. um, in a lot of ways. Uh, and uh, I, anyway, I came to have great respect for the, the leadership, the training, the insights, the the, the uh, thoughtfulness, the respect that our leaders have uh, for the men and women they lead but, and, and their families, which is also very important, but also under, to, help, to help the public understand that we've got to work together as a people and the military leadership understands the importance of their units of their combat unit, that they're brothers and sisters together. And so the opera, you know, the, the, the idea that a, a military leader would denigrate would be a racist or a bigot or, a, or a, 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 have a problem with females uh, or with ethnic origins. The idea that that could take place in the military is anathema to the idea that you're there together, you're gonna to protect your buddies. We're all in this one, one boat together, as you would put it in your program, one Detroit together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so, and you've developed an incredible expertise uh, on the military uh, while you're in the Senate. You also developed some real expertise uh, on, on foreign relations um, uh, and, and do a lot of important work in that realm, uh, tell us how that developed. Uh, what what interested you in that realm? Well, it's when you decide whether or not to send people to war or authorize it, you're making the most important decision that you can make. There is no more significant decision than putting our men and women at risk and and doing what uh, we have to call upon their families uh, to do. And so when you, when you finally, you know, gain that understanding, um, you have to take it seriously. We did a lot of traveling all over the world. We met with a lot of leaders. As a matter of fact, Joe Biden gave us uh, one of our early lessons in the importance of meeting with foreign leaders. 
and, and, and having coalitions with allies. You know, the idea that we would have a president like this last president of ours, who hopefully is the last president like him, Trump divided people. He divided us from our allies. And my gosh, if we're gonna be in a more secure world, you got to work with allies and people who have similar points of view, who believe in democratic government, hopefully. Uh, and there's threats to that which have taken place. Yeah. Um, one of the hallmarks of your tenure in, in, in Congress, uh, I think, uh, is the necessity for and the ability to work across the aisle. Um, uh, you were a master, really, at, at, at a compromise, and and not just compromise for the sake of, of getting things done, but, but I always felt like it was compromise as a matter of principle and out of respect for, um, you know, for your counterparts who, who happen to be of, of, of a different party. Um, talk about how you developed uh, those relationships uh, in the Senate and, and, and why you thought that was, that was so critical and important. Well, I was president of the city council in Detroit. As you know, Stephen, uh, you were much too young at the, <laughs> to remember those days, like some of us old folks. But at any rate, uh, you, you learn very quickly that if you want to govern and if you want to get things done, we're in a democracy with great diversity. Hopefully we relish that diversity. We thrive on it, we share it, and we were proud of the diversity, hopefully. That's who we should be. At any rate, we also uh, have, a, there's no other way you're gonna get things done for your people unless you're willing to compromise. It's not a dirty word. There was a group that was called the Tea Party a couple of decades ago that came to Washington say, thinking, well, I didn't come here to compromise. Mm -hmm. You know, when you look at them and you say, well, if you didn't come here to compromise, if you ran for office thinking in a democracy, you're gonna dictate outcomes. It's gonna be your way or the highway. Then you, you didn't come here to govern. Mm -hmm came here just to mouth off and to get reelected with what you think might be attractive to the people. So it's, compromise is essential. It's absolutely essential to getting things done. And as you point out, uh, I had some great friendships across the aisle, including John McCain, John Warner, and a number of others. Um, when you think about Washington now, and you look at the, the way we have arguments and disagreements, uh, the things that we're arguing about, including really dramatically changing the rules uh, of the Senate where you served uh, for so long. Uh, do you worry that, uh, that we won't be able to preserve the governance that we have, that we won't ha be able to do things uh, the way we have uh, in the past if we, if we abandon all of those, those traditions and institutions? Well, I worry if we abandon them that uh, we would lose some real strengths, uh, including the, the willingness to listen to others. Uh, but uh, yeah, I worry, but I'm also more confident than ever. This recent experience with this physical attack on our government by some extremists uh, who, uh, uh, you know, who proved again the strength of this democracy. We've proven it many times. This, what we went through a couple of weeks ago with people trying to take over the government physically in the Congress uh, was not the first time or the worst time that our democracy was threatened. We've been through civil war. Where we had a much, much more difficult experience uh, than we did a few weeks ago. We survived the civil war. We had a great leader at the Civil War. We needed a great leader, and we had one at the time. Um, and uh, what Lincoln did was, as far as I'm concerned, uh, set a hallmark for what a leader's got to do 
which again, because he was not perfect, in a lot of ways he was flawed, mm -hmm. but he was not flawed in terms of his va basic values. He was not flawed in terms of what he thought leadership must be, uh, which is to take risks for your people, political risks, and in his case, physical risks, because he knew when he went to Washington for his inauguration, and there's a great book out about it, that he was under great threat of assassination. Literally thousands of people who were out to assassinate him because he was opposed to slavery. And uh, so he was under huge threat and he uh, was one of the great leaders that we've had. Do you, do you, did you ever imagine that we would see in our time, something like we saw on January 6th where the building where you worked uh, for decades uh, in, in Washington was literally under attack from Americans uh, who, who wanted to disrupt uh, the process of certifying, you know, our every four-year uh, presidential election. I mean, um, it, it's still just describing it is kind of surreal uh, to me. But 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 I wonder, as somebody who spent so much time in that building, how that how that visited with you. Well, I was obviously disgusted, distraught, but not totally surprised. You know, there are some really crazy people out here who are racist, who will destroy things they don't like. Thankfully, it's not a, a big number, but it, they're there and we have to protect ourselves against them in many ways by looking at our own shortfalls and seeing where each of us can be more open to friendships and other people where we can cross lines, which maybe haven't been crossed before to make us a stronger community. Uh, we can always do that. But I was not, uh, I wasn't surprised totally that the, those kind of people exist. Uh, and I also was not surprised when they lost because uh, there's some real strengths that this country has that we've proven over the years. And we've got to, we've got to stand for those strengths in the world. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things that this new president is so strong at is working with other countries to rebuild the values that internationally we've got to stand for if the world itself is going to be uh, safer. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, uh, in terms of your book, um, what, what in your book would you recommend to somebody who's just been elected to the US Senate and is new at the work and maybe has a whole uh, passel of ideas that they brought with them to Washington and all the energy in the world? Um, what about your time there uh, would help them get their feet planted and start to be productive about, uh, about the work? Well, it's something uh, which we've spoken about a little bit already on our program here. Uh, it's that you're, if you wanna get things done, uh, if you wanna govern, and if you want to accomplish things uh, and not just say things which you might help your reelection because you think they're popular or whatever, uh, you're probably going to be wrong most of the time anyway, but putting that aside, um, that you've just got to understand that people are running for office with great passions and what they believe in, just as passionate as the beliefs that we all have and what we believe in, but you've got to temper those passions with the reality. And the reality is that we've got something here which is so precious in this country uh, that we've got to protect it. And the way we protect it is that you fight for it like crazy, but you also, part of that fight is recognize where compromise is essential to get something done. Uh, and that's what's going on right now in Washington. Uh, we have a president who understands that it's not bad to reach across the aisle even the people who you have 90% disagreement with, 
Ted Kennedy recognized that, for God's sake. Mm -hmm. you know, he's as liberal a guy as, as you, you could want, and he was a great buddy of mine. And, and he and his wife were great buddies of Barb and me, as a matter of fact. But, um, you know, you just, uh, uh, you just have to recognize that uh, that strength in our public is essential. And uh, come to Washington, being willing to listen, really important. Listen, don't be arrogant. Don't think you know a lot because you've been elected. Uh, recognize that you represent a fairly small sliver of a great country and that those pieces have got to be put together with a great leader and leaders uh, if we're going to be what we should be in the world and for ourselves and our kids. Yeah. Okay, Senator Carl Levin, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for the gift of this book, uh, but also thanks so much for the gift of uh, your long service in the Senate for the state of Michigan. Thank you, Steve. Great being with you.